part two chapter six of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clark chapter six the sun's distance the question of the sun's distance arises naturally from the consideration of his temperature since the intensity of the radiations emitted as compared with those received and measured depends upon it but the knowledge of that distance has a value quite apart from its connection with solar physics the semi-diameter of the earth's orbit is our standard measure for the universe it is the great fundamental datum of astronomy the unit of space any error in the estimation of which is multiplied and repeated in a thousand different ways both in the planetary and sidereal systems hence its determination was called by airy the noblest problem in astronomy it is also one of the most difficult the quantities dealt with are so minute that their sure grasp tasks all the resources of modern science an observational inaccuracy which would set the moon nearer to or farther from us than she really is by one hundred miles would vitiate an estimate of the sun's distance to the extent of sixteen million what is needed in order to attain knowledge of the desired exactness is no less than this to measure an angle about equal to that subtended by a halfpenny two thousand feet from the eye within a little more than a thousandth part of its value the angle thus represented is what is called the horizontal parallax of the sun by this amount the breadth of a halfpenny at two thousand feet he is to a spectator on the rotating earth removed at rising and setting from his meridian place in the heavens such in other terms would be the magnitude of the terrestrial radius as viewed from the sun if we knew this magnitude with certainty and precision we should also know with certainty and precision the dimensions of the earth being as they are well ascertained the distance of the sun in fact the one quantity commonly stands for the other in works treating professedly of astronomy but this angle of parallax or apparent displacement cannot be directly measured cannot even be perceived with the finest instruments not from its smallness the parallactic shift of the nearest of the stars as seen from opposite sides of the earth's orbit is many times smaller but at the sun's limb and close to the horizon where the visual angle in question opens out to its full extent atmospheric troubles become overwhelming and altogether swamp the far more minute effects of parallax there remain indirect methods astronomers are well acquainted with the proportions which the various planetary orbits bear to each other they are so connected in the manner expressed by kepler's third law that the periods being known it only needs to find the interval between any two of them in order to infer at once the distances separating them all from one another and from the sun the plan is given what we want to discover is the scale upon which it is drawn so that if we can get a reliable measure of the distance of a single planet from the earth our problem is solved now some of our fellow-travellers in our unending journey round the sun come at times well within the scope of celestial trigonometry the orbit of mars lies at one point not more than thirty-five million miles outside that of the earth and when the two bodies happen to arrive together in or near the favourable spot a conjuncture which occurs every fifteen years the desired opportunity is granted mars is then in opposition or on the opposite side of us from the sun crossing the meridian consequently at midnight it was from an 
opposition of mars observed in sixteen seventy two by ricker at cayenne in concert with cassini in paris that the first scientific estimate of the sun's distance was derived it appeared to be nearly eighty seven millions of miles parallax nine point five minutes while flamsteed deduced eighty one million seven hundred thousand parallax ten minutes from his independent observations of the same occurrence a difference quite insignificant at that stage of the inquiry but picard's result was just half flamsteed's parallax twenty minutes distance forty one million miles and la hire considered that we must be separated from the hearth of our system by an interval of at least one hundred and thirty six million miles so that uncertainty continued to have an enormous range venus on the other hand comes closest to the earth when she passes between it and the sun at such times of inferior conjunction she is however still twenty six million miles or in round numbers one hundred nine times as distant as the moon moreover she is so immersed in the sun's rays that it is only when her path lies across his disk that the requisite facilities for measurement are afforded these partial eclipses of the sun by venus as enki termed them are coupled together in pairs of which the components are separated by eight years recurring at intervals alternately of one hundred and five and a half and one hundred and twenty one and a half years thus the first calculated transit took place in december sixteen thirty one and its companion observed by horrocks in the same month in s sixteen thirty nine then after the lapse of a hundred and twenty one and a half years came the june couple of seventeen sixty one and seventeen sixty nine and again after one hundred and five and a half the two last observed december eighth eighteen seventy four and december sixth eighteen eighty two throughout the twentieth century there will be no transit of venus but the astronomers of the twenty-first will only have to wait four years for the first of a june pair the rarity of these events is due to the fact that the orbits of the earth and venus do not lie in the same plane if they did there would be a transit each time that our twin planet overtakes us in her more rapid circling that is on an average every five hundred and eighty four days as things are actually arranged she passes above or below the sun except when she happens to be very near the line of intersection of the two tracks such an occurrence as a transit of venus seems at first sight full of promise for solving the problem of the sun's distance for nothing would appear easier than to determine exactly either the duration of the passage of a small dark orb across a large brilliant disk or the instant of its entry upon or exit from it and the differences in these times which owing to the comparative nearness of venus are quite considerable as observed from remote parts of the earth can be translated into differences of space that is into apparent or parallactic displacements whereby the distance of venus becomes known and thence by a simple sum in proportion the distance of the sun but in that word exactly what snares and pitfalls lie hid it is so easy to think and to say so indefinitely hard to realize the astronomers of the eighteenth century were full of hope and zeal they confidently expected to attain through the double opportunity offered them to something like a permanent settlement of the statistics of our system they were grievously disappointed the uncertainty as to the sun's distance which they had counted upon reducing to a few hundred thousand miles remained at many millions in eighteen twenty two however enki then director of the seaberg observatory near gotha undertook to bring order out of the confusion of discordant and discordantly interpreted observations his combined result for both transits seventeen sixty one and seventeen sixty nine was published in eighteen twenty four 
and met universal acquiescence the parallax of the sun thereby established was eight point five seven seven six minutes corresponding to a mean distance of ninety five and a fourth million miles yet this abolition of doubt was far from being so satisfactory as it seemed serenity on the point lasted exactly thirty years it was disturbed in eighteen fifty four by hansen's announcement that the observed motions of the moon could be drawn into accord with theory only on the terms of bringing the sun considerably nearer to us than he was supposed to be dr matthew stewart professor of mathematics in the university of edinburgh had made a futile attempt in seventeen sixty three to deduce the sun's distance from his disturbing power over our satellite tobias mayer of gottingen however whose short career was fruitful of suggestions struck out the right way to the same end and laplace in the seventh book of the mecanique celeste gave a solar parallax derived from the lunar parallactic inequality substantially identical with that issuing from enki's subsequent discussion of the eighteenth century transits thus two wholly independent methods the trigonometrical or method by survey and the gravitational or method by perturbation seemed to corroborate each the upshot of the use of the other until the nineteenth century was well past its meridian it is singular how often errors conspire to lead conviction astray hansen's note of alarm in eighteen fifty four was echoed by le verrier in eighteen fifty eight he found that an apparent monthly oscillation of the sun which reflects a real monthly movement of the earth round its common centre of gravity with the moon and which depends for its amount solely on the mass of the moon and the distance of the sun required a diminution in the admitted value of that distance by fully four million miles three years later he pointed out that certain perplexing discrepancies between the observed and computed places both of venus and mars would vanish on the adoption of a similar measure moreover a favourable opposition of mars gave the opportunity in eighteen sixty two for fresh observations which separately worked out by stone and winecki agreed with all the newer investigations in fixing the great unit at slightly over ninety one million miles in newcomb's hands they gave ninety two and a half million the accumulating evidence in favour of a large reduction in the sun's distance was just then reinforced by an auxiliary result of a totally different and unexpected kind the discovery that light does not travel instantaneously from point to point but takes some short time in transmission was made by olaus romer in sixteen seventy five through observing that the eclipses of jupiter's satellites invariably occurred later when the earth was on the far side than when it was on the near side of its orbit half the difference or the time spent by a luminous vibration in crossing the mean radius of the earth's orbit is called the light equation and the determination of its precise value has claimed the minute care distinctive of modern astronomy delambre in seventeen ninety two made it four hundred and ninety three seconds glaisnap a russian astronomer raised the estimate in eighteen seventy four to five hundred and one professor harkness adopts a safe medium value of four hundred and ninety eight seconds hence if we had any independent means of ascertaining how fast light travels we could tell at once how far off the sun is there is yet another way by which knowledge of the swiftness of light would lead us straight to the goal the heavenly bodies are perceived when carefully watched and measured to be pushed forward out of their true places in the direction of the earth's motion by a very minute quantity this effect already adverted to has been known since bradley's time as aberration it arises from a combination of the two movements of the earth round the sun and of the light waves through the ether 
if the earth stood still or if light spent no time on the road from the stars such an effect would not exist its amount represents the proportion between the velocities with which the earth and the light rays pursue their respective journeys this proportion is roughly one to ten thousand so that here again if we knew the rate per second of luminous transmission we should also know the rate per second of the earth's movement consequently the size of its orbit and the distance of the sun but until lately instead of finding the distance of the sun from the velocity of light there has been no means of ascertaining the velocity of light except through the imperfect knowledge possessed as to the distance of the sun the first successful terrestrial experiments on the point date from eighteen forty nine and it is certainly no slight triumph of human ingenuity to have taken rigorous account of the delay of a sunbeam in flashing from one mirror to another fizeau led the way and he was succeeded after a few months by leon foucault who in eighteen sixty two had so far perfected wheatstone's method of revolving mirrors as to be able to announce with authority that light travels slower and that the sun was in consequence nearer than had been supposed thus a third line of separate research was found to converge to the same point with the two others such a conspiracy of proof was not to be resisted and at the anniversary meeting of the royal astronomical society in february eighteen sixty four the correction of the solar distance took the foremost place in the annals of the year lest however a sudden bound of four million miles nearer to the centre of our system should shake public faith in astronomical accuracy it was explained that the change in the solar parallax corresponding to that huge leap amounted to no more than the breadth of a human hair one hundred and twenty five feet from the eye the nautical almanac gave from eighteen seventy the altered value of eight point nine five minutes for which newcomb's result of eight point eight five minutes adopted in eighteen sixty nine in the berlin ephemeris was substituted some ten years later in astronomical literature the change was initiated by sir edmund beckett in the first edition eighteen sixty five of his astronomy without mathematics if any doubt remained as to the misleading character of enki's deduction so long implicitly trusted in it was removed by powalke's and stone's rediscussions in eighteen sixty four and eighteen sixty eight respectively of the transit observations of seventeen sixty nine using improved determinations of the longitude of the various stations and a selective judgment in dealing with their materials which however indispensable did not escape adverse criticism they brought out results confirmatory of the no longer disputed necessity for largely increasing the solar parallax and proportionately diminishing the solar distance once more in eighteen ninety and this time with better success the eighteenth-century transits were investigated by professor newcomb turning to account the experience gained in the interim regarding the optical phenomena accompanying such events he elicited from the mass of somewhat discordant observations at his command a parallax eight point seven nine minutes in close agreement with the value given by sundry modes of recent research conclusions on the subject however were still regarded as purely provisional a transit of venus was fast approaching and to its arbitrament as to that of a court of final appeal the pending question was to be referred it is true that the verdict in the same case by the same tribunal a century earlier had proved of so indecisive a character as to form only a starting-point for fresh litigation 
but that century had not passed in vain and it was confidently anticipated that observational difficulties then equally unexpected and insuperable would yield to the elaborate care and skill of forewarned modern preparation the conditions of the transit of december eighth eighteen seventy four were sketched out by sir george airy then astronomer royal in eighteen fifty seven and formed the subject of eager discussion in this and other countries down to the very eve of the occurrence in these mr proctor took a leading part and it was due to his urgent representations that provision was made for the employment of the method identified with the name of halley which had been too hastily assumed inapplicable to the first of each transit pair it depends upon the difference in the length of time taken by the planet to cross the sun's disk as seen from various points of the terrestrial surface and requires accordingly the visibility of both entrance and exit at the same station since these were in eighteen seventy four separated by about three and a half hours and the interval may be much longer the choice of posts for the successful use of the method of durations is a matter of some difficulty the system described by delisle in seventeen sixty on the other hand involves merely noting the instant of ingress or egress according to situation from opposite extremities of a terrestrial diameter the disparity in time giving a measure of the planet's apparent displacement hence of its actual rate of travel in miles per minute from which its distances severally from earth and sun are immediately deducible its chief attendant difficulty is the necessity for accurately fixing the longitudes of the points of observation but this was much more sensibly felt a century ago than it is now the improved facility and certainty of modern determinations tending to give the delilian plan a decided superiority over its rival these two traditional methods were supplemented in eighteen seventy four by the camera and the heliometer from photography above all much was expected observations made by its means would have the advantages of impartiality multitude and permanence peculiarities of vision and bias of judgment would be eliminated the slow progress of the phenomenon would permit an indefinite number of pictures to be taken their epochs fixed to a fraction of a second while subsequent leisurely comparison and measurement could hardly fail it was thought to educe approximate truth from the mass of accumulated evidence the use of the heliometer much relied on by german observers was so far similar to that of the camera that the object aimed at by both was the determination of the relative positions of the centres of the sun and venus viewed at the same absolute instant from opposite sides of the globe so that the principle of the two older methods was to ascertain the exact times of meeting between the solar and planetary limbs that of the two modern to determine the position of the dark body already thrown into complete relief by its shining background the former are methods by contact the latter methods by projection every country which had a reputation to keep or to gain for scientific zeal was forward to cooperate in the great cosmopolitan enterprise of the transit france and germany each sent out six expeditions twenty-six stations were in russian twelve in english eight in american three in italian one in dutch occupation in all at a cost of nearly a quarter of a million some fourscore distinct posts of observation were provided among them such inhospitable and all but inaccessible rocks in the bleak southern ocean as st paul's and campbell's islands swept by hurricanes and fitted only for the habitation of sea-birds where the daring votaries of science in the wise prevision of a long leaguer by the elements were supplied with stores for many months or even a whole year 
siberia and the sandwich islands were thickly beset with observers parties of three nationalities encamped within the mists of kerguelen island expressly termed the land of desolation in the sanguine though not wholly frustrated hope of a glimpse of the sun at the right moment m jansen narrowly escaped destruction from a typhoon in the china seas on his way to nagasaki lord lindsay now earl of crawford and balcares equipped at his private expense an expedition to mauritius which was in itself an epitome of modern resource and ingenuity during several years the practical methods best suited to ensure success for the impending enterprise formed a subject of european debate official commissions were appointed to receive and decide upon evidence and experiments were in progress for the purpose of defining the actual circumstances of contacts the precise determination of which constituted the only tried though by no means an assuredly safe road to the end in view in england america france and germany artificial transits were mounted and the members of the various expeditions were carefully trained to unanimity in estimating the phases of junction and separation between a moving dark circular body and a broad illuminated disk in the previous century a formidable and prevalent phenomenon which acquired notoriety as the black drop or black ligament had swamped all pretensions to rigid accuracy it may be described as substituting adhesion for contact the limbs of the sun and planet instead of meeting and parting with the desirable clean definiteness clinging together as if made of some glutinous material and prolonging their connection by means of a dark band or dark threads stretched between them some astronomers ascribed this baffling appearance entirely to instrumental imperfections others to atmospheric agitation others again to the optical encroachment of light upon darkness known as irradiation it is probable that all these causes conspired in various measure to produce it and it is certain that its conspicuous appearance may by suitable precautions be obviated the organization of the british forces reflected the utmost credit on the energy and ability of lieutenant colonel tupman who was responsible for the whole no useful measure was neglected each observer went out ticketed with his personal equation his senses drilled into a species of martial discipline his powers absorbed so far as possible in the action of a cosmopolitan observing machine instrumental uniformity and uniformity of method were obtainable and were attained but diversity of judgment unhappily survived the best directed efforts for its extirpation the eventful day had no sooner passed than telegrams began to pour in announcing an outcome of considerable though not unqualified success the weather had proved generally favourable the manifold arrangements had worked well contacts had been plentifully observed photographs in lavish abundance had been secured a store of materials in short had been laid up of which it would take years to work out the full results by calculation gradually nevertheless it came to be known that the hope of a definitive issue must be abandoned unanimity was found to be as remote as ever the dreaded black ligament gave indeed less trouble than was expected but another appearance supervened which took most observers by surprise this was the illumination due to the atmosphere of venus astronomers it is true were not ignorant that the planet had on previous occasions been seen girdled with a lucid ring but its power to mar observations by the distorting effect of refraction had scarcely been reckoned with it proved however to be very great such was the difficulty of determining the critical instant of internal contact that in colonel tupman's words 
observers side by side with adequate optical means differed as much as twenty or thirty seconds in the times they recorded for phenomena which they have described in almost identical language such uncertainties in the data admitted of a corresponding variety in the results from the british observations of ingress and egress sir george airy derived in eighteen seventy seven a solar parallax of eight point seven six minutes corrected to eight point seven five four minutes indicating a mean distance of ninety three million three hundred and seventy five thousand miles mr stone obtained a value of ninety two millions parallax eight point eight eight minutes and held any parallax less than eight point eight four minutes or more than eight point nine three minutes to be absolutely negatived by the documents available yet from the same colonel tupman deduced eight point eight one minutes implying a distance seven hundred thousand miles greater than stone had obtained the best french observations of contacts gave a parallax of about eight point eight eight minutes french micrometric measures the obviously exaggerated one of nine point zero five minutes photography as practised by most of the european parties was a total failure utterly discrepant values of the microscopic displacements designed to serve as sounding lines for the solar system issued from attempts to measure even the most promising pictures you might as well try to measure the zodiacal light it was remarked to sir george airy those taken on the american plan of using telescopes of so great focal length as to afford without further enlargement an image of the requisite size gave notably better results from an elaborate comparison of those dating from vladivostok nagasaki and pekin with others from Kuguelen and chatham islands professor d p todd of amherst college deduced a solar distance of about ninety two million miles parallax eight point eight eight three minutes plus or minus zero point zero three four minutes and the value was much favoured by concurrent evidence on the whole estimates of the great spatial unit cannot be said to have gained any security from the combined effort of eighteen seventy four a few months before the transit mr proctor considered that the uncertainty then amounted to one million four hundred and forty eight thousand miles five years after the transit professor harkness judged it to be still one million five hundred and seventy five thousand nine hundred and fifty miles yet it had been hoped that it would have been brought down to one hundred thousand as regards the end for which it had been undertaken the grand campaign had come to nothing nevertheless no sign of discouragement was apparent there was a change of view but no relaxation of purpose the problem it was seen could be solved by no single heroic effort but by the patient approximation of gradual improvements astronomers accordingly looked round for fresh means or more refined expedients for applying those already known a new phase of exertion was entered upon on september five eighteen seventy seven mars came into opposition near the part of his orbit which lies nearest to that of the earth and dr gill now sir david took advantage of the circumstance to appeal once more to him for a decision on the quaestio vexata of the sun's distance he chose as the scene of his labours the island of ascension and for their plan a method recommended by airy in eighteen fifty seven but never before fairly tried this is known as the diurnal method of parallaxes its principle consists in substituting successive morning and evening observations from the same spot for simultaneous observations from remote spots the rotation of the earth supplying the necessary difference in the points of view its great advantage is that of unity in performance a single mind looking through the same pair of eyes reinforced with the same optical appliances is employed throughout and the errors inseparable from the combination of data collected under different conditions are avoided 
there are many cases in which one man can do the work of two better than two men can do the work of one the result of gill's skilful determinations made with lord lindsay's heliometer was a solar parallax of eight point seven eight minutes corresponding to a distance of ninety three million eighty thousand miles the bestowal of the royal astronomical society's gold medal stamped the merit of this distinguished service but there are other subjects for this kind of inquiry besides mars and venus professor gall of breslau suggested in eighteen seventy two that some of the minor planets might be got to repay astronomers for much disinterested toil spent in unravelling their motions by lending aid to their efforts towards a correct celestial survey ten or twelve come near enough and are bright enough for the purpose in fact the absence of sensible magnitude is one of their chief recommendations since a point of light offers far greater facilities for exact measurement than a disc the first attempt to work this new vein was made at the opposition of phocea in eighteen seventy two and from observations of flora in the following year at twelve observatories in the northern and southern hemispheres gall deduced a solar parallax of eight point eight seven minutes at mauritius in eighteen seventy four lord lindsay and sir david gill applied the diurnal method to juno then conveniently situated for the purpose and the continued use of similar occasions affords an unexceptionable means for improving knowledge of the sun's distance they frequently recur they need no elaborate preparation a single astronomer armed with a heliometer can do all the requisite work dr gill however organized a more complex plan of operations upon iris in eighteen eighty eight and upon victoria and sappho in eighteen eighty nine a novel method was adopted its object was to secure simultaneous observations made from opposite sides of the globe just when the planet lay in the plane passing through the centre of the earth and the two observers the same pair of reference stars being used on each occasion the displacements caused by parallax were thus in a sense doubled since the star to which the planet seemed approximated in the northern hemisphere showed as if slightly removed from it in the southern and vice versa as the planet pursued its course fresh star couples came into play during the weeks that the favourable period lasted in these determinations only heliometers were employed dr elkin of yale college cooperated throughout and the heliometers of dresden guttingen bamberg and leipzig shared in the work while dr Auers of berlin was sir david gill's personal coadjutor at the cape voluminous data were collected meridian observations of the stars of reference for victoria occupied twenty-one establishments during four months the direct work of triangulation kept four heliometers in almost exclusive use for the best part of a year and the ensuing toilsome computations carried out during three years at the cape observatory filled two bulky tomes with their details gill's final result published in eighteen ninety seven was a parallax of eight point eight zero two minutes equivalent to a solar distance of ninety two million eight hundred and seventy four thousand and it was qualified by a probable error so small that the value might well have been accepted as definitive but for an unlooked-for discovery the minor planet eros detected august fourteen eighteen ninety eight was found to pursue a course rendering it an almost ideal intermediary in solar parallax determinations once in thirty years it comes within fifteen million miles of the earth and although the next of these choice epochs must be awaited for some decades an opposition too favourable to be neglected occurred in nineteen hundred 
at an international conference accordingly held at paris in july of that year a plan of photographic operations was concerted between the representatives of no less than fifty-eight observatories its primary object was to secure a large stock of negatives showing the planet with the comparison stars along the route traversed by it from october nineteen hundred to march nineteen o one and this at least was successfully attained their measurement will in due time educe the apparent displacements of the moving object as viewed simultaneously from remote parts of the earth and the upshot should be a solar parallax adequate in accuracy to the exigent demands of the twentieth century the second of the nineteenth century pair of venus transits was looked forward to with much abated enthusiasm russia refused her active cooperation in observing it on the ground that oppositions of the minor planets were trigonometrically more useful and financially far less costly and her example was followed by austria while italian astronomers limited their sphere of action to their own peninsula nevertheless it was generally held that a phenomenon which the world could not again witness until it was four generations older should at the price of any effort not be allowed to pass in neglect the persuasion of its importance justified the summoning of an international conference at paris in eighteen eighty one from which however america preferring independent action held aloof it was decided to give delisle's method another trial and the ambiguities attending and marring its use were sought to be obviated by careful regulations for ensuring agreement in the estimation of the critical moments of ingress and egress but in fact as m puiseux had shown contacts between the limbs of the sun and planets so far from possessing the geometrical simplicity attributed to them are really made up of a prolonged succession of various and varying phases impossible either to predict or identify with anything like rigid exactitude sir robert ball compared the task of determining the precise instant of their meeting or parting to that of telling the hour with accuracy on a watch without a minute hand and the comparison is admittedly inadequate for not only is the apparent movement of venus across the sun extremely slow being but the excess of her real motion over that of the earth but three distinct atmospheres the solar terrestrial and cytherean combine to deform outlines and mask the geometrical relations which it is desired to connect with a strict count of time the result was very much what had been expected the arrangements were excellent and were only in a few cases disconcerted by bad weather the british parties under the experienced guidance of mr stone the late radcliffe observer took up positions scattered over the globe from queensland to bermuda the americans collected a whole library of photographs the germans and belgians trusted to the heliometer the french used the camera as an adjunct to the method of contacts yet little or no approach was made to solving the problem thus from six hundred and six measures of venus on the sun taken with a new kind of heliometer at santiago in chile m houzeau of the brussels observatory derived a solar parallax of eight point nine zero seven minutes and a distance of ninety one million seven hundred and twenty seven thousand miles but the probable errors of this determination amounted to zero point zero eight four minutes either way it was subject to a more or less of nine hundred thousand or to a total uncertainty of one million eight hundred thousand miles the probable error of the english result published in eighteen eighty seven was less formidable yet the details of the discussion showed that no great confidence could be placed in it the sun's distance came out ninety two million five hundred and sixty thousand miles while ninety two million three hundred and sixty thousand was given by professor harkness's investigation of one thousand four hundred and seventy five american photographs finally dr Auers deduced from the german heliometric measures the unsatisfactorily small value of ninety two million miles the transit of eighteen eighty two had not then 
brought about the desired unanimity the state and progress of knowledge on this important topic were summed up by fay and harkness in eighteen eighty one the methods employed in its investigation fall as we have seen into three separate classes the trigonometrical the gravitational and the phototachometrical an ungainly adjective used to describe the method by the velocity of light each has its special difficulties and sources of error each has counterbalancing advantages the only trustworthy result from celestial surveys was at that time furnished by gill's observations of mars in eighteen seventy seven but the method by lunar and planetary disturbances is unlike all the others in having time on its side it is this which le verrier declared with emphasis must inevitably prevail because its accuracy is continually growing the scarcely perceptible errors which still impede its application are of such a nature as to accumulate year by year eventually then they will challenge and must receive a more and more perfect correction the light velocity method however claimed and for some years justified m fay's preference by a beautiful series of experiments on foucault's principle michelson fixed in eighteen seventy nine the rate of luminous transmission at two hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and thirty corrected later to two hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ten kilometers a second this determination was held by professor todd to be entitled to four times as much confidence as any previous one and if the solar parallax of eight point seven five eight minutes deduced from it by professor harkness errs somewhat by defect it is doubtless because glasenapp's light equation with which it was combined errs slightly by excess but all earlier efforts of the kind were thrown into the shade by professor newcomb's arduous operations at washington in eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty two the scale upon which they were conducted was in itself impressive foucault's entire apparatus in eighteen sixty two had been enclosed in a single room newcomb's revolving and fixed mirrors between which the rays of light were to run their timed course were set up on opposite shores of the potomac at a distance of nearly four kilometres this advantage was turned to the utmost account by ingenuity and skill in contrivance and execution and the deduced velocity of two hundred and ninety nine thousand eight hundred and sixty kilometres equals one hundred eighty six thousand three hundred twenty eight miles a second had an estimated error thirty kilometres only one-tenth that ascribed by cornu to his own result in eighteen seventy four just as these experiments were concluded in eighteen eighty two m magnus neron of st petersburg published an elaborate investigation of the small annular displacements of the stars due to the successive transmission of light involving an increase of struve's constant of aberration from twenty point four four five minutes to twenty point four nine two minutes and from the new value combined with newcomb's light velocity was derived a valuable approximation to the sun's distance concluded at ninety two million nine hundred and five thousand twenty one miles parallax equals eight point seven nine four minutes yet it is not quite certain that neuron's correction was an improvement a differential method of determining the amount of aberration struck out by m lowry of paris avoids most of the objections to the absolute method previously in vogue and the upshot of its application in eighteen ninety one was to show that struve's constant might better be retained than altered lowry's of twenty point four four seven minutes varying from it only to an insignificant extent professor hall had moreover deduced nearly the same value twenty point four five four minutes from the washington observations since eighteen sixty two of alpha lyri vega whence in conjunction with newcomb's rate of light transmission he arrived at a solar parallax of eight point eight one minutes 
inverting the process sir david gill in eighteen ninety seven derived the constant from the parallax if the earth's orbit have a mean radius as found by him of ninety two million eight hundred and seventy four thousand miles then he calculated the aberration of light newcomb's measures of its velocity being supposed exact amounts to twenty point four six seven minutes this figure can need very slight correction professor harkness surveyed in eighteen ninety one from an eclectic point of view the general situation as regarded the sun's parallax convinced that no single method deserved an exclusive preference he reached a plausible result through the combination on the principle of least squares that is by the mathematical rules of probability of all the various quantities upon which the great datum depends it thus summed up and harmonized the whole of the multifarious evidence bearing upon the point and as modified in eighteen ninety four falls very satisfactorily into line with the cape determination we may then at least provisionally accept ninety two million eight hundred and seventy thousand miles as the length of our measuring rod for space nor do we hazard much in fixing one hundred thousand miles as the outside limit of its future correction End of chapter six chapter seven of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clerk chapter seven part one planets and satellites johann hieronymus schroeder was the herschel of germany he did not it is true possess the more brilliant gifts of his rival herschel's piercing discernment comprehensive intelligence and inventive splendor were wanting to him he was nevertheless the founder of descriptive astronomy in germany as herschel was in england born in erfurt in 1745, he prosecuted legal studies at Göttingen, and there imbibed from Kastner a lifelong devotion to science. From the law, however, he got the means of living, and what was to the full as precious to him the means of observing. Entering the sphere of Hanoverian officialism in 1788, he settled a few years later at Lilienthal, near Bremen, as Oberamtmann, or chief magistrate. Here he built a small observatory, enriched in 1785 with a seven-foot reflector by Herschel, then one of the most powerful instruments to be found anywhere out of England. It was soon surpassed, through his exertions, by the first fruits of native industry in that branch. Schrader of Kiel transferred his workshops to Lilienthal in 1792 and constructed there, under the superintendence and at the cost of the astronomical Oberamtmann, a 13-foot reflector, declared by Lalanda to be the finest telescope in existence and one 27 feet in focal length, probably as inferior to its predecessor in real efficiency as it was superior in size. Thus, with the instruments of gradually increasing power, Schurter studied during thirty-four years the topography of the moon and planets. The field was then almost untrodden. He had but few and casual predecessors, and has since had no equal in the sustained and concentrated patience of his hourly watchings. Both their prolixity and their enthusiasm are faithfully reflected in his various treatises, yet the one may be pardoned for the sake of the other, especially when it is remembered that he struck out a substantially new line, and that one of the main lines of future advance. Moreover, his infectious zeal communicated itself. He set the example of observing when there was scarcely an observer in Germany, and under his roof Harding and Bessel received their training as practical astronomers but he was reserved to see evil days 
early in eighteen thirteen the french under van damme occupied bremen on the night of april twenty the vale of lilies was by their wanton destructiveness laid waste with fire the government offices were destroyed and with them the chief part of Schurter's property including the whole stock of his books and writings there was worse behind a few days later his observatory which had escaped the conflagration was broken into pillaged and ruined his life was wrecked with it he survived the catastrophe three years without the means to repair or the power to forget it and gradually sank from disappointment into decay terminated by death august twenty ninth eighteen sixteen he had indeed done all the work he was capable of and though not of the first quality it was far from contemptible he laid the foundation of the new comparative study of the moon's surface and the descriptive particulars of the planets laboriously collected by him constituted a store of more or less reliable information hardly added to during the ensuing half-century they rested it is true under some shadow of doubt but the most recent observations have tended on several points to rehabilitate the discredited authority of the lilienthal astronomer we may now briefly resume and pursue in its further progress the course of his studies taking the planets in the order of their distances from the sun in april seventeen ninety two sure to saw reason to conclude from the gradual degradation of light on its partially illuminated disk that mercury possesses a tolerably dense atmosphere during the transit of may seventh seventeen ninety nine he was moreover struck with the appearance of a ring of softened luminosity encircling the planet to an apparent height of three seconds or about a quarter of its own diameter although a mere thought in texture it remained persistently visible both with the seven foot and the thirteen foot reflectors armed with powers up to two eighty eight it had a well-marked grayish boundary and reminded him though indefinitely fainter of the penumbra of a sunspot a similar appendage had been noticed by de plantade at montpelier november eleventh seventeen thirty six and again in seventeen eighty six and seventeen eighty nine by prosperin and flogergues but herschel on november nine eighteen o two saw the preceding limb of the planet projected on the sun cut the luminous solar clouds with the most perfect sharpness the presence however of a halo was unmistakable in eighteen thirty two when professor mull of utrecht described it as a nebulous ring of a darker tinge approaching to the violet color again to Huygens and stone november fifth eighteen sixty eight it showed as lucid and most distinct no change in the color of the glasses used or the powers applied could get rid of it and it lasted throughout the transit it was next seen by christie and duncan at greenwich may sixth eighteen seventy eight and with much precision of detail by trovolo at cambridge u s professor holden on the other hand noted at hastings on hudson the total absence of all anomalous appearances nor could any vestige of them be perceived by barnard at lick on november tenth eighteen ninety four various effects of irradiation and diffraction were however observed by lowell and w h pickering at flagstaff and davidson was favored at san francisco with glimpses of the historic aureola as well as of a central whitish spot which often accompanies it that both are somehow of optical production can scarcely be doubted nothing can be learned from them regarding the planet's physical condition airy showed that refraction in a mercurian atmosphere could not possibly originate the noted aureola which must accordingly be set down as strictly an ocular nervous phenomenon it is less easy to escape from this conclusion that we find the virtually airless moon capable of exhibiting a like appendage 
professor stephen alexander of the united states survey with two other observers perceived during the eclipse of the sun of july eighteenth eighteen sixty the advancing lunar limb to be bordered with a bright band and photographic effects of the same kind appear in pictures of transits of venus and partial solar eclipses the spectroscope affords little information as to the constitution of mercury its light is of course that of the sun reflected and its spectrum is consequently a faint echo of the freinhofer spectrum dr h c vogel who first examined it in april eighteen seventy one suspected traces of the action of an atmosphere like ours but it would seem on slight grounds it is however certainly very poor in blue rays more definite conclusions were in eighteen seventy four derived by zollner from photometric observations of mercurian phases a similar study of the waxing and waning moon had afforded him the curious discovery that light changes dependent upon phase vary with the nature of the reflecting surface following a totally different law on a smooth homogeneous globe and on a rugged and mountainous one now the phases of mercury so far as could be determined from only two sets of observations correspond with the latter kind of structure strictly analogous to those of the moon they seem to indicate an analogous mode of surface formation this conclusion was fully borne out by Müller's more extended observations at Potsdam during the years 1885 to 1893. Practical assurance was gained from them that the innermost planet has a rough rind of dusky rock, absorbing all but 17% of the light poured upon it by the fierce adjacent sun. Its albedo, in other words, is 0 0.17, which is precisely that ascribed to the moon. The absence of any appreciable Mercurian atmosphere followed almost necessarily from these results. On March 26, 1800, Schroeter, observing with his 13-foot reflector in a peculiarly clear sky, perceived the southern horn of Mercury's crescent to be quite distinctly blunted. Interception of sunlight by a Mercurian mountain rather more than eleven english miles high explained the effect to his satisfaction by carefully timing its recurrence he concluded rotation on an axis in a period of twenty-four hours four minutes the first determination of the kind rewarded twenty years of unceasing vigilance it received ostensible confirmation from the successive appearances of a dusky streak and blotch in may and june eighteen o one these, however, were inferred to be no permanent markings on the body of the planet, but atmospheric formations, the streak at times drifting forwards, it was thought, under the fluctuating influence of Mercurian breezes. From a rediscussion of these somewhat doubtful observations, Bessel inferred that Mercury rotates on an axis inclined 70 degrees to the plane of its orbit in 24 hours 53 seconds. The rounded appearance of the southern horn seen by Schroeder was more or less doubtfully caught by Noble, 1864, Burton and Franks, 1877, but was obvious to Mr. W. F. Denning at Bristol on the morning of November 5, 1882. That the southern polar regions are usually less bright than the northern is well ascertained, but the cause of the deficiency remains dubious if inequalities of surface are in question they must be on a considerable scale and a similar explanation might be given of the deformations of the terminator or dividing line between darkness and light in the planet's phases first remarked by schroeter and again clearly seen by truvelo in eighteen seventy eight and eighteen eighty one the displacement during four days of certain brilliant and dusky spaces on the disk indicated to mr denning in 1882 rotation in about 25 hours while the general aspect of the planet reminded him of that of mars but the difficulties in the way of its observation are enormously enhanced by its constant close attendance on the sun in his sustained study of the features of mercury 
Schurter had no imitator until Schiaparelli took up the task at Milan in 1882. His observations were made in daylight. It was found that much more could be seen, and higher magnifying powers used. High up in the sky, near the sun, than at low altitudes, through the agitated air of morning or evening twilight. A notable discovery ensued. Following the planet hour by hour, instead of making necessarily brief inspections at intervals of about a day, as previous observers had done, it was found that the markings faintly visible remained sensibly fixed, hence that there was no rotation in a period at all comparable with that of the earth and after long and patient watching the conclusion was at last reached that mercury turns on his axis in the same time needed to complete a revolution in his orbit one of his hemispheres then is always averted from the sun as one of the moon's hemispheres from the earth while the other never shifts from beneath his torrid rays the librations however of mercury are on a larger scale than those of the moon because he travels in a more eccentric path the temporary inequalities arising between his even pacing on an axis and his alternately accelerated and retarded elliptical movement occasion in fact an oscillation to and fro of the boundaries of light and darkness on his globe over an arc of forty seven degrees twenty two minutes in the course of his year over eighty eight days thus the regions of perpetual day and perpetual night are separated by two segments amounting to one-fourth of the entire surface where the sun rises and sets once in eighty eight days else there is no variation from the intense glare on one side of the globe and the nocturnal blackness on the other to Schiaparelli's scrutiny, Mercury appeared as a spotty globe, enveloped in a tolerably dense atmosphere. The brownish stripes and streaks discerned on his rose-tinged disk and judged to be permanent were made the basis of a chart. They were not, indeed, always equally well seen. They disappeared regularly near the limb and were at times veiled even when centrally situated. Some of them had been clearly perceived by de Ball at Bothkamp in 1882. Mr. Lowell followed Schiaparelli's example by observing Mercury in the full glare of noon. The best time to study him, he remarked, is when planetary almanacs state Mercury invisible. A remarkable series of drawings executed, some at Flagstaff in 1896, the remainder at Mexico in 1897, supplied grounds for the following among other conclusions mercury rotates synchronously with its revolution that is once in eighty-eight days on an axis sensibly perpendicular to its orbital plane no certain signs of a mercurian atmosphere are visible the globe is seamed and furrowed with long narrow markings explicable as cracks in cooling it is and always was a dead world from micrometrical measures, moreover, the inferences were drawn that the planet's mass had a probable value about one-twentieth that of the Earth, while its mean density falls considerably short of the terrestrial standard. The theory of Mercury's movements has always given trouble. In Lalande's, as in Maslin's time, the planet seemed to exist for no other purpose than to throw discredit on astronomers and even to Levier's powerful analysis, it long proved recalcitrant. On the 12th of September, 1869, however, he was able to announce before the Academy of Sciences the terms of a compromise between observation and calculation. They involved the addition of a new member to the solar system, the hitherto unrecognized presence of a body about the size of mercury itself revolving at somewhat less than half its mean distance from the sun or if farther than of less mass and vice versa would it was pointed out produce exactly the effect required of displacing the perihelion of the former planet thirty-eight minutes 
a century more than could otherwise be accounted for the planes of the two orbits however should not lie far apart as otherwise a nodal disturbance would arise not perceived to exist it was added that a ring of asteroids similarly placed would answer the purpose equally well and it was more likely to have escaped notice upon the heels of this forecast followed promptly a seeming verification dr lescobald a physician residing at orgeries whose slender opportunities had not blunted his hopes of achievement had ever since eighteen forty five when he witnessed the transit of mercury cherished the idea that an unknown planet might be caught thus projected on the solar background unable to observe continuously until eighteen fifty eight he on march twenty sixth eighteen fifty nine saw what he had expected a small perfectly round object slowly traversing the sun's disk the fruitless expectation of reobserving the phenomena however kept him silent and it was not until december twenty second after the news of leverrier's prediction had reached him that he wrote to acquaint him with his supposed discovery the imperial astronomer thereupon hurried down to orgeries and by his personal inspection of the simple apparatus used by searching cross-examination and local inquiry convinced himself of the genuine character and substantial accuracy of the reported observation he named the new planet vulcan and computed elements giving it a period of revolution slightly under twenty days but it has never since been seen m laius director of the brazilian coast survey thought himself justified in asserting that it never had been seen observing the sun for twelve minutes after the supposed ingress recorded at auguries he noted those particular regions of its surface as tre uniformis de intensite he subsequently however admitted lescarbault's good faith at first rashly questioned the planet-seeking doctor was in truth only one among many victims of similar illusions waning interest in the subject was revived by a fresh announcement of a transit witnessed it was asserted by weber at peccolo april fourth eighteen seventy six the pseudo-planet indeed was detected shortly afterwards on the greenwich photographs and was found to have been seen by m ventosa at madrid in its true character of a sunspot without penumbra but Levier had meantime undertaken the investigation of a list of twenty similar dubious appearances collected by haas and published by wolf in eighteen seventy two from these five were picked out as referring in all likelihood to the same body the reality of whose existence was now confidently asserted and of which more or less probable transits were fixed for march twenty second eighteen seventy seven and october fifteenth eighteen eighty two but widespread watchfulness notwithstanding no suspicious object came into view at either epoch the next announcement of the discovery of vulcan was on the occasion of the total solar eclipse of july twenty nine eighteen seventy eight this time it was stated to have been seen at some distance southwest of the obscured sun as a ruddy star with a minute planetary disk and its simultaneous detection by two observers the late professor james c watson stationed at rawlins wyoming territory and professor lewis swift at denver colorado was at first readily admitted but their separate observations could on a closer examination by no possibility be brought into harmony and if valid certainly referred to two distinct objects if not to four each astronomer eventually claiming a pair of planets nor could any one of the four be identified with lescarbault's and levier's vulcan which if substantial body revolving round the sun must then have been found on the east side of that luminary the most feasible explanation of the puzzle seems to be that watson and swift merely saw each the same two stars in cancer haste and excitement doing the rest nevertheless they strenuously maintained their opposite conviction 
intramercurian planets have since been diligently searched for when the opportunity of a total eclipse offered especially during the long obscuration at caroline island not only did professor holden sweep in the solar vicinity but Palisa and Truvolo agreed to divide the field of exploration and thus make sure of whatever planetary prey there might be within reach, yet with only negative results. Photographic explorations during recent eclipses have been equally fruitless. Belief in the presence of any considerable body or bodies within the orbit of Mercury is accordingly at a low ebb yet the existence of the anomaly in the Mercurian movements indicated by Leverrier has been made only surer by further research. Its elucidation constitutes one of the pending problems of astronomy. End of chapter 7, part 1during the 19th century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the 19th Century by Agnes Mary Clerke. Chapter 7, Part 2 Planets and Satellites. From the observation at Bologna in 1666 through 67 of some very faint spots, Domenico Cassini concluded a rotation or libration of Venus, he was not sure which, in about 23 hours. By Bianchini in 1726, the period was augmented to 24 days, 8 hours. J. J. Cassini, however, in 1740, showed that the data collected by both observers were consistent with rotation in 23 hours 20 minutes. So the matter rested until Schroeder's time. After watching nine years in vain, he at last, February 28, 1788, perceived the ordinarily uniform brightness of the planet's disk to be marbled with a filmy streak, which returned periodically to the same position in about 23 hours 28 minutes. This approximate estimate was corrected by the application of a more definite criterion. On December 28, 1789, the southern horn of the crescent Venus was seen truncated, an outlying lucid point interrupting the darkness beyond. Precisely the same appearance recurred two years later, giving for the planet's rotation a period of 23 hours 21 minutes. To this, only 22 seconds were added by De Vico as a result of over 10,000 observations made with the Koshwa refractor of the Collegio Romano, 1839-41. to The axis of rotation was found to be much more bowed towards the orbital plane than that of the Earth, the equator making with it an angle of 53 degrees 11 minutes. These conclusions inspired it is true, much distrust. Consequently, there were no received ideas on the subject to be subverted. Nevertheless, a shock of surprise was felt at Schiaparelli's announcement, early in 1890, that Venus most probably rotates after the fashion just previously ascribed to Mercury. A continuous series of observations from November 1877 to February 1878 with their records and above a hundred drawings, supplied the chief part of the data upon which he rested his conclusions. They certainly appeared exceptionally well grounded, and the doubts at first qualifying them were removed by a fresh set of determinations in July 1895. Most observers had depended, in their attempts to ascertain the rotation period of Venus, upon evanescent shadings most likely of atmospheric origin and scarcely recognizable from day to day schiaparelli fixed his attention upon round defined lustrously white spots the presence of which near the cusps of the illuminated crescent has been attested for close upon two centuries his steady watch over them showed the invariability of their position 
with regard to the terminator and this is as much as to say that the regions of day and night do not shift on the surface of the planet in other words she keeps the same face always turned towards the sun moreover since her orbit is nearly circular libratory effects are very small they amount in fact to only just one thirtieth of those serving to modify the severe contrasts of climate in mercury confirmatory evidence of schiaparelli's result for venus is not wanting thus observations irreconcilable with a swift rate of rotation were made at bothkamp in eighteen seventy one by vogel and Lossi, and a drawing executed by professor holden with the great washington reflector december fifteenth eighteen seventy seven showed the same markings in the positions recorded at milan to have been occupied by them eight hours previously further a series of observations carried out by mr periton at nice may fifteen to october fourth eighteen ninety and from mount mounier in eighteen ninety five through six with the special aim of testing the inference of synchronous rotation and revolution proved strongly corroborative of it a remarkable collection of drawings made by mr lowell in eighteen ninety six appeared decisive in its favor ticini at rome muscari at catania and etna Ceruli at Toronto, obtained in eighteen ninety two through six evidence similar in purport on the other hand Neeston of Brussels found reason to revert to Vico's discarded elements for the planet's rotation, and Truvelo, Stanley Williams, Villager, and Leo Brenner so far agreed with him as to adopt a period of approximately twenty four hours. Finally, E. von Oppolzer suggested an appeal to the spectroscope, and Belopolsky secured in nineteen hundred spectrograms apparently marked by the minute displacements corresponding to a rapid rate of axial movement but they were avowedly taken only as an experiment with unsuitable apparatus and the desirable verification of their supposed import is not yet forthcoming until it is schiaparelli's period of two hundred and twenty five days must be allowed to hold the field effects attributed to great differences of level in the surface of venus have struck many observers francesco fontana at naples in sixteen forty three noticed irregularities along the inner edge of the crescent la in seventeen hundred considered them regard being had to difference of distance to be much more strongly marked than those visible in the moon Schroeter's assertions to the same effect, though scouted with some unnecessary vehemence by Herschel, have since been repeatedly confirmed, amongst others by Madler, De Vico, Langdon, who in 1873 saw the broken line of the Terminator with peculiar distinctness through a veil of auroral cloud, by Denning, March 30, 1881, despite preliminary impressions to the contrary, as well as by c v zenger at prague january eighteen eighty three the great mountain mass presumed to occasion the periodical blunting of the southern horn was precariously estimated by the lilienthal observer to rise to the prodigious height of nearly twenty seven miles or just five times the elevation of mount everest yet the phenomenon persists whatever may be thought of the explanation moreover the speck of light beyond interpreted as the visible sign of a detached peak rising high enough above the encircling shadow to catch the first and last rays of the sun was frequently discerned by baron von erdborn in eighteen seventy six while an object near the northern horn of the crescent strongly resembling a lunar ring mountain was delineated both by de vico in 1841 and by denning forty years later we are almost equally sure that venus as that the earth is encompassed with an atmosphere yet notwithstanding luminous appearances plainly due to refraction during the transits both of 1761 and 1769 schroeter in 1792 
took the initiative in coming to a definite conclusion on the subject it was founded first on the rapid diminution of brilliancy towards the terminator attributed to atmospheric absorption next on the extension beyond a semicircle of the horns of the crescent lastly on the presence of a bluish gleam illuminating the early hours of the cytherean night with what was taken to be genuine twilight even herschel admitted that sunlight by the same effect through which the heavenly bodies show visibly above our horizons while still geometrically below them appeared to be bent round the shoulder of the globe of venus ample confirmation of the fact has since been afforded at dorpat in may eighteen forty nine the planet being within three degrees twenty six minutes of inferior conjunction madler found the arms of waning light upon the disk to embrace no less than two hundred and forty degrees of its extent and in december eighteen forty two mr guthrie of burvey new brunswick actually observed under similar conditions the whole circumference to be lit up with a faint nebulous glow the same curious phenomenon was intermittently seen by mr leeson prince at uckfield in september eighteen sixty one but with more satisfactory distinctness by mr c s lyman of yale college before and after the conjunction of december eleventh eighteen sixty six and during nearly five hours previous to the transit of eighteen seventy four when the yellowish ring of refracted light showed at one point an approach to interruption possibly through the intervention of a bank of clouds again on december second eighteen ninety eight venus being one degrees forty five minutes from the sun's centre mr h n russell of the halstead observatory descried the coalescence of the cusps and founded on the observation a valuable discussion of such effects taking account of certain features in the case left unnoticed by neeson and proctor he inferred from them the presence of a cytherean atmosphere considerably less refractive than our own although possibly in its lower strata encumbered with dust or haze similar appearances are conspicuous during transits but while the mercurian halo is characteristically seen on the sun the silver thread round the limb of venus commonly shows on the part off the sun there are however instances of each description in both cases mr grant in collecting the records of physical phenomena accompanying the transits of seventeen sixty one and seventeen sixty nine remarks that no one person saw both kinds of annulus and argues a dissimilarity in their respective modes of production such a dissimilarity probably exists in the sense that the inner section of the ring is illusory the outer a genuine result of the bending of light in a gaseous envelope but the distinction of separate visibility has not been borne out by recent experience several of the australian observers during the transit of eighteen seventy four witnessed the complete phenomenon mr j mcdonnell at eden saw a shadowy nebulous ring surround the whole desk when ingress was two-thirds accomplished mr Tornaghi at goldborn perceived a halo entire and unmistakable at half egress similar observations were made at sydney and were renewed in eighteen eighty two by lesquerbal at auguries by metzger in java and by barnard at vanderbilt university spectroscopic indications of aqueous vapor as present in the atmosphere of venus were obtained in eighteen seventy four and eighteen eighty two by ticini and rico in italy and by young in new jersey jansen however who made a special study of the point subsequently to the transit of eighteen eighty two found them much less certain than he had anticipated and vogel by repeated examinations eighteen seventy one through seventy three could detect only the very slightest variations from the pattern of the solar spectrum 
some additions there indeed seem to be in the thickening of a few water and oxygen lines but so nearly evanescent as to induce the persuasion that most of the light we receive from venus has traversed only the tenuous upper portion of its atmosphere it is reflected at any rate with comparatively slight diminution on the twenty sixth and twenty seventh of september eighteen seventy eight a close conjunction gave mr james nasmith the rare opportunity of watching venus and mercury for several hours side by side in the field of his reflector when the former appeared to him like clean silver the latter as dull as lead or zinc yet the light incident upon mercury is on average three and a half times as strong as the light reaching venus thus the reflective power of venus must be singularly strong and we find accordingly from a combination of zollner's with muller's results that its albedo is but little inferior to that of new fallen snow in other words it gives back seventy seven per cent of the luminous rays impinging upon it this extraordinary brilliancy would be intelligible were it permissible to suppose that we see nothing of the planet but a dense canopy of clouds but the hypothesis is discountenanced by the flagstaff observations and is irreconcilable with the visibility of mountainous elevations and permanent surface markings to mr lowell these were so distinct and unchanging as to furnish data for a chart of the cytherean globe and the peculiar arrangement of divergent shading exhibited in it cannot offhand be set down as unreal in view of perotin's earlier discernment of analogous linear traces grutusen snow-caps however it is safe to say do not exist as such although shining regions near the poles form a well-attested trait of the strange cytherean landscape the secondary or ashen light of venus was first noticed by riccioli in sixteen forty three it was seen by durham about seventeen fifteen by kirch in seventeen twenty one by schroeter and harding in eighteen o six and the reality of the appearance has since been authenticated by numerous and trustworthy observations it is precisely similar to that of the old moon and the new moon's arms and zenger who witnessed it with unusual distinctness january eighth eighteen eighty three supposes it due to the same cause namely to the faint gleam of reflected earth light from the night side of the planet when we remember however that full earth light on venus at its nearest has little more than one twelve thousandth its intensity on the moon we see at once that the explanation is inadequate nor can professor sapphorix by phosphorescence of the warm and teeming oceans with which zollner regarded the globe of venus as mainly covered be seriously entertained vogel's suggestion is more plausible he and o losa at bothkamp november three to eleven eighteen seventy one saw the dark hemisphere partially illuminated by secondary light extending thirty degrees from the terminator and thought the effect might be produced by a very extensive twilight others have had recourse to the analogy of our aurorae and j lamp suggested that the grayish gleam visible to him at both camp october twenty one and twenty six eighteen eighty seven might be an accompaniment of electrical processes connected with the planet's meteorology whatever the origin of the phenomenon it may serve on a night in rapt hemisphere to dissipate some of the thick darkness otherwise encroached upon only by the pale light of stars venus was once supposed to possess a satellite but belief in its existence has died out no one indeed has caught even a deceptive glimpse of such an object during the last hundred and twenty-five years yet it was repeatedly and one might have thought well observed in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries fontana discovered it in sixteen forty five 
cassini an adept in the art of seeing recognized it in sixteen seventy two and again in sixteen eighty six short watched it for a full hour in seventeen forty with varied instrumental means tobias mayer in seventeen fifty nine montaigne in seventeen sixty one several astronomers at copenhagen in march seventeen sixty four noted what they considered its unmistakable presence as did horrebow in seventeen sixty eight but paul strubon who in eighteen eighty seven submitted all the available data on the subject to a searching examination identified horrebow's satellite with libra a fifth magnitude star and a few other apparitions were by his industry similarly explained away nevertheless several withstood all efforts to account for them and together form a most curious case of illusion for it is quite certain that venus has no such conspicuous attendant the third planet encountered in travelling outward from the sun is the abode of man he has in consequence opportunities for studying its physical habitudes altogether different from the baffling glimpse afforded to him of the other members of the solar family regarding the earth then a mass of knowledge so varied and comprehensive has been accumulated as to form a science or rather several sciences apart but underneath all lie astronomical relations the recognition and investigation of which constitute one of the most significant intellectual events of the present century it is indeed far from easy to draw a line of logical distinction between items of knowledge which have their proper place here and those which should be left to the historian of geology there are some however of which the cosmical connections are so close that it is impossible to overlook them among these is the ascertainment of the solidity of the globe at first sight it seems difficult to conceive what the apparent positions of the stars can have to do with subterranean conditions yet it was from star measurements alone that hopkins in eighteen thirty nine concluded the earth to be solid to a depth of at least eight hundred or a thousand miles his argument was that if it were a mere shell filled with liquid precession and nutation would be much larger than they are observed to be for the shell alone would follow the pull of the sun and moon on its equatorial girdle leaving the liquid behind and being thus so much the lighter would move the more readily there is it is true grave reason to doubt whether this reasoning corresponds with the actual facts of the case but the conclusion to which it led has been otherwise affirmed and extended indications of an identical purport have been derived from another kind of external disturbance affecting our globe through the same agencies lord kelvin then sir william thompson pointed out in eighteen sixty two that tidal influences are brought to bear on land as well as on water although obedience to them is perceptible only in the mobile element some bodily distortion of the earth's figure must however take place unless we suppose it is of absolute or preternatural rigidity and the amount of such distortion can be determined from its effect in diminishing oceanic tides below their calculated value for if the earth were perfectly plastic to the stresses of solar and lunar gravity tides in the ordinary sense would not exist continents and oceans would swell and subside together it is to the difference in the behavior of solid and liquid terrestrial constituents that the ebb and flow of the waters are due six years later the distinguished glasgow professor suggested that this criterion might by the aid of a prolonged series of exact tidal observations be practically applied to test the interior condition of our planet in eighteen eighty two accordingly suitable data extending over thirty-three years 
having at length become available mr g h darwin performed the laborious task of their analysis with the general result that the effective rigidity of the earth's mass must be at least as great as that of steel ratification from an unexpected quarter has lately been brought to this conclusion the question of a possible mobility in the earth's axis of rotation has often been mooted now at last it has received an affirmative reply dr kustner detected in his observations of eighteen eighty four through eighty five effects apparently springing from a minute variation in the latitude of berlin the matter having been brought before the international geodetic association in eighteen eighty eight special observations were set on foot at berlin potsdam prague strasbourg the upshot of which was to bring plainly to view synchronous and seemingly periodic fluctuations of latitude to the extent of half a second of arc the reality of these was verified by an expedition to honolulu in eighteen ninety one through ninety two the variations there corresponding inversely to those simultaneously determined in europe their character was completely defined by mr s c chandler's discussion in october of eighteen ninety one he showed that they could be explained by supposing the pole of the earth to describe a circle with a radius of thirty feet in a period of fourteen months confirmation of this hypothesis was found by dr b a gould in the cordoba observations and it was provided with a physical basis through the able cooperation of professor newcomb the earth owing to its ellipsoidal shape should apart from disturbance rotate upon its axis of figure or shortest diameter since thus alone can the centrifugal forces generated by its spinning balance each other temporary causes however such as heavy falls of snow or rain limited to one continental area the shifting of ice masses even the movements of winds may render the globe slightly lopsided and thus oblige it to forsake its normal axis and rotate on one somewhat divergent from it this instantaneous axis for it is incessantly changing must by mathematical theory revolve round the axis of figure in a period of three hundred and six days provided that is to say the earth were a perfectly rigid body but it is far from being so it yields sensibly to every strain put upon it and this yielding tends to protract the time of circulation of the displaced pole the length of its period then serves as a kind of measure of the plasticity of the globe which according to newcomb's and s s howe's independent calculations seems to be a little less than that of steel in an earth compacted of steel the instantaneous axis would revolve in four hundred and forty one days in the actual earth the process is accomplished in four hundred and twenty eight days by this new path accordingly astronomers have been led to an identical estimate of the consistence of our globe with that derived from tidal investigations variations of latitude are intrinsically complex to produce them an incalculable interplay of causes must be at work with each its proper period and law of action all the elements of the phenomenon are then in a perpetual state of flux and absorb for their continual redetermination the arduous and combined labors of many astronomers nor is this trouble superfluous minute in extent though they be the shiftings of the pole menace the very foundations of exact celestial science their neglect will leave the entire fabric insecure just at the beginning of the present century they reached a predicted minimum but are expected again to augment their range after the year nineteen o two the interesting suggestion has been made by mr j holm that such fluctuations are in some obscure way affected by changes in solar activity and conform like them to an eleven-year cycle 
in a paper read before the geological society december fifteenth eighteen thirty sir john herschel threw out the idea that the perplexing changes of climate revealed by the geological record might be explained through certain slow fluctuations in the eccentricity of the earth's orbit produced by the disturbing action of the other planets shortly afterwards however he abandoned the position as untenable and it was left to the late dr james crawl in eighteen sixty four and subsequent years to reoccupy and fortify it within restricted limits as lagrange and more certainly and definitively le verrier proved the path pursued by our planet round the sun alternately contracts in the course of ages into a moderate ellipse and expands almost to a circle the major axis and consequently the mean distance remaining invariable even at present when the eccentricity approaches a minimum the sun is nearer to us in january than in july by above three million miles and some eight hundred and fifty thousand years ago this difference was more than four times as great dr kroll brought together a mass of evidence to support the view that at epochs of considerable eccentricity the hemisphere of which the winter occurring at aphelion was both intensified and prolonged must have undergone extensive glaciation while the opposite hemisphere with a short mild winter and long cool summer enjoyed an approach to perennial spring these conditions were exactly reversed at the end of ten thousand five hundred years through the shifting of the perihelion combined with the precession of the equinoxes the frozen hemisphere blooming into a luxuriant garden as its seasons came round to occur at the opposite sites of the terrestrial orbit and the vernal hemisphere subsiding simultaneously into ice-bound rigor thus a plausible explanation was offered of the anomalous alternations of glacial and semi-tropical periods attested on incontrovertible geological evidence as having succeeded each other in times past over what are now temperate regions they succeeded each other it is true with much less frequency and regularity than the theory demanded but the discrepancy was overlooked or smoothed away the most recent glacial epoch was placed by dr kroll about two hundred thousand years ago when the eccentricity of the earth's orbit was three point four times as great as it is now at present a faint representation of such a state of things is afforded by the southern hemisphere one condition of glaciation in the coincidence of winter with the maximum of remoteness from the sun is present the other a high eccentricity is deficient yet the ring of ice-bound territory hemming in the southern pole is well known to be far more extensive than the corresponding region in the north the verification of this ingenious hypothesis depends upon a variety of intricate meteorological conditions some of which have been adversely interpreted by competent authorities what is still more serious its acceptance seems precluded by time relations of a simple kind dr wright has established with some approach to certainty that glacial conditions seized in canada and the united states about ten or twelve thousand years ago the erosive action of the falls of niagara qualifies them to serve as a clepsydra or water clock on a grand scale and their chronological indications have been amply corroborated elsewhere and otherwise on the same continent the astronomical ice age however should have been enormously more antique no reconciliation of the facts with the theory appears possible the first attempt at an experimental estimate of the mean density of the earth was maskelyne's observation in seventeen seventy four of the deflection of a plumb line through the attraction of shehalion the conclusion thence derived 
that our globe weighs four and a half times as much as an equal bulk of water was not very exact it was considerably improved upon by cavendish who in seventeen ninety eight brought into use the torsion balance constructed for the same purpose by john michel the resulting estimate of five point four eight was raised to five point six six by francis bailey's elaborate repetition of the process in eighteen thirty eight through forty two from experiments on the subject made in eighteen seventy two to seventy three by cornu and bale the slightly inferior value of five point five six was derived and it was further shown that the data collected by bailey when corrected for a systematic error gave practically the same result five point five five mr wilsing's of five point five eight obtained at potsdam in eighteen eighty nine nearly agreed with it while professor pointing by means of a common balance arrived at a terrestrial mean density of five point four nine professor boys next entered the field with an exquisite apparatus in which a quartz fibre performed the functions of a torsion rod and the figure five point five three determined by him and exactly confirmed by dr brown's research at mariaschein bohemia in eighteen ninety six may be called the standard value of the required datum newton's guess at the average weight of the earth as five or six times that of water has thus been curiously verified operations for determining the figure of the earth were carried out during the last century on an unprecedented scale the russo scandinavian arc of which the measurement was completed under the direction of the elder struve in eighteen fifty five reached from hammerfest to asmalia on the danube a length of twenty five degrees twenty minutes but little inferior to it was the indian arc begun by lambton in the first years of the century continued by everest revised and extended by walker both were surpassed in compass by the anglo-french arc which embraced twenty eight degrees and considerable segments of meridians near the atlantic and pacific shores of north america were measured under the auspices of the united states coast survey but these operations shrink into insignificance by comparison with sir david gill's grandiose scheme for uniting two hemispheres by a continuous network of triangulation the history of geodesy in south africa began with la Ciel's measurements in seventeen fifty two they were repeated and enlarged in scope by sir thomas mcclear in eighteen forty one through forty eight and his determinations prepared the way for a complete survey of cape colony and natal executed during the ten years of eighteen eighty three through ninety two by colonel morris r e under the direction of sir david gill Pechiawanaland and Rhodesia were subsequently included in the work, and the Royal Astronomer obtained in 1900 the support of the International Geodetic Association for its extension to the mouth of the Nile. Nor was this the limit of his design. By carrying the survey along the Levantine coast, connection can be established with Struve's system and the magnificent amplitude of a hundred and five degrees will be given to the conjoined african and european arcs meantime the french have undertaken the re-measurement of bosier's peruvian arc and a corresponding russo-swedish enterprise is progressing in spitzenbergen so that abundant materials will ere long be provided for fresh investigations of the shape and size of our planet the smallness of the outstanding uncertainty can be judged by comparing j b listings with general clark's results published in the same year eighteen seventy eight listing stated the dimensions of the terrestrial spheroid as follows equatorial radius is three thousand nine hundred and sixty miles the polar radius is three thousand nine hundred and forty seven miles ellipticity is one 
over 288.5. Clark's corresponding figures were 3,963 and 3,950 miles, giving an ellipticity of 1 over 293.5. The value of the latter fraction at present generally adopted is 1 over 292. That is to say, the thickness of the protuberant equatorial ring is held to be 1 over 292 of the equatorial radius. From astronomical considerations, it is true, Newcomb estimated the ratio at 1 over 308, but for obtaining this particular datum, Geodetical methods are unquestionably to be preferred. End of chapter 7, part 2.